Hello Let's there. We get the recording going. There we go. All right. How's everybody doing tonight? Gosh, it's been a little while. It has. It really it's has. Been a few weeks since we've been able to get started I was looking, on here. I was looking um, the other day. We we actually haven't done this since the end of March. Has it been that long? It's been that long because we went through April and we're, we were busy Passover. with Passover. And, of course, the beginning of this month, we've been trying to get things ready and do different things. And So it's been a little while. It's I mean, been a the little last while. time we were here on a Wednesday we night. We did the Davidic Covenant. Y'all remember? We did the yeah. Davidic Covenant last time. And yeah. uh, those were some special things, you know, because they all lead up to the... Um, the new covenant. We didn't yes. really talk about that one by itself, did we? Yes, we did. Okay, so oh we no, did. no, no, we did the new covenant last time. We did the, the new covenant, covenant last it was the time. New covenant, yeah. Oh, she's confusing me. I'm confused. <laughs> it's been a long day. <laughs> yes, it has. But it's a it's a good day. You know, it's been Amen. a beautiful day out there, and uh, so you know, in talking about the covenants, one of the important things that we keep in mind, you know, is that they 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 demonstrate and show the gospel just real quick, you know. Mm -hmm. The Abrahamic covenant is the covenant of our redemption. You know, that's how Yeshua, he is the high priest in the order of Melchizedek, and that's operating under the terms of the uh, of the Abrahamic covenant. You know, he is the one who oversees the meal for that. So Abrahamic is about our redemption, and the Israelites were saved from Egypt and redeemed out of Egypt uh, under the terms of the Abrahamic covenant. Then they get to the Mount Sinai, Mm -hmm. That's the the Abrahamic covenant is the covenant of justification. Of justification, yes. Yeah. So, uh, so you get to Mount Sinai where God has already saved them, but then He gives them the Torah so they they can learn how to live, and that is a picture of our of our sanctification, mm -hmm. where we learn what is pleasing to God and we learn how to live in such a way that is pleasing to Him. So the the, the Mosaic covenant is about sanctification. The Davidic Covenant, which we were referring to, is about uh, the resurrection and the glorification and the kingdom of God, you know, the messianic kingdom. With the king on the throne. Mm -hmm. So that's a, that's the picture of the glorification. That's still waiting for its fulfillment in the future. Well, actually, all three are waiting for well, complete fulfillment. That is, the, that is the new covenant, when all three come together and are fulfilled in their totality. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> with Messiah, you know, reigning on the throne. So that that's where we were in terms of the covenant. I'm going to scoot over just a little bit here. But, um, and so within that, you know, here we are, we're living in an age that is still somewhat dominated by uh, where we're at in the, in the um, Mosaic covenant. You know, that's one thing that Hebrews talked about, and we've talked about that before, if I can find it real quick. Because I had forgotten to look this verse up, but I think it's chapter 9 or 10. So I'm going to wait. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Um, we haven't even told you what we're going to talk about tonight. <laughs> right, so in talking about, this is chapter 8, the end of chapter 8 yes. of Hebrews, where he says he's talking about the new covenant, and he says, And in saying new, he has treated the first as old, but what is being made old and aging is close to vanishing. And so it hasn't completely vanished yet. We're still no. working and operating in this world because it hasn't been turned off yet. It hasn't been done away with yet. Uh, so, you know, we're still turned living. Off? Well, I'm thinking about I the know, beeping I, know, guy. I, I, I keep hearing. I, I, that's what I thought. Um, but um, <laughs> we have a, a random, you know, kitchen it's... electronics beeping at yeah. us. Yeah. The but um, <clears throat> but anyway, you know, so we are we are still in the time period of where sanctification is supposed to be, redemption and sanctification are supposed to be going on right now. Yes, we're all waiting for the glorification part. Um, but so redemption and sanctification are going on as we speak, and so once you become redeemed, once you become saved. Then that process of sanctification kicks in in the life of a believer, and you're supposed to be growing. You're supposed to be uh, moving upward in your walk of faith, and we call that what? We call that a process where you're learning. That's, that's being a disciple. That's being a disciple. That's yes. being that's discipleship. 
So that's what we're going to be talking about a good bit tonight is the idea of discipleship. Uh, and what what is we like to say discipleship, but so many times we don't really know what discipleship means or what it entails. Uh, and actually, the Mosaic Covenant is an essential part of our discipleship because it's in the, the Mosaic Covenant where in the Torah where we learn how to be a disciple. But so oftentimes we learn that process, we grow in that process through the influence and impact and teaching of, mm -hmm. of someone who has already been through the process, right? Through, so who has seen this and we can see them live this life. Of course, who is our ultimate example? Yeshua. Yeshua is. And it's it the okay. I'm gonna back up for a minute. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, the Mosaic Covenant. I, I like to refer to the Mosaic Covenant as God's discipleship program. Mm -hmm. Okay. It is all about teaching God's redeemed people how to live. It is His discipleship program. If you ever want a book on discipleship, read the Torah. Because that is exactly what it is. It's God telling his people what he expects of them. Mm -hmm. And even what the consequences are for obedience and disobedience. Mm -hmm. Blessings for the Blessings obedience. Blessings cur and curses. Mm -hmm. And so that is God's discipleship program. Yeshua implemented it perfectly. Yes. And taught his disciples apostles to fact. implement it perfectly right and so when we want to see a human example of what god's discipleship looks like it's yeshua mm -hmm. that that is you know he, he is our king he is our teacher he is he is our rabbi he is our lord he is our king we have to look to him for all things mm -hmm. and how he obeyed his father is a very important is very important for us we follow in his footsteps yes. we, we copy and grab hold of his seat seat and just like go with him just like yeshua yeshua did that in the power of the holy spirit did he mm -hmm. not mm -hmm. And so we are to live in the power of the Holy Spirit. We are to pay attention to what the Spirit is telling us. Okay? How He is moving in our lives, how He's moving around us, even in other people's lives, what He is telling us from the Word, what He is telling us from circumstances, teaching us how to live in the times in which we live. Mm -hmm. So, if we look at the Torah or the Mosaic Covenant, particularly as God's discipleship program, Yeshua as, as the one who perfectly implemented that in human form, life. you know, in human life, in the flesh, then we have not only the manual, but the example of how we are to live mm -hmm. so with that being said let's go to matthew chapter 28 absolutely matthew chapter 28 starting in verse 16. it helps if i turn over a couple of pages so most of y'all should know this passage you hear yes. it talked about a lot in in traditional church circles it's often called the um the great commission but there, it's talking about discipleship and making disciples. Uh, it says, Now the eleven disciples went to the Galilee, to the mountain Yeshua had designated. And when they saw him, they worshipped, but some wavered. And Yeshua came up to them and spoke to them, saying, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations immersing them in the name of the Father and, of, and the Son and the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Let's start with that idea of all authority has been given to him. Mm -hmm. Okay, 
All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to him. Let's go to Daniel chapter 7. Go to Daniel chapter but 7. But don't lose your spot. Don't lose your spot. That's right. Go to Daniel chapter 7. Okay. Verse 13. And this is when Yeshua, with the Son of Man, comes before the Ancient of Days. Okay? And the courtroom in heaven. All right? Verse 13, it says, I kept watching, that's Daniel speaking, the night visions when I saw coming with the clouds of heaven, someone like a son of man, he approached the ancient one and was led into his presence. To him was given rulership, glory, and a kingdom so that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His rulership is an eternal rulership that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. And so when Yeshua says, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth, he's saying, this has been done. Mm -hmm. I've been to the courtroom. This is about me. You know, this fulfillment is about me. So since all people's Nations and languages are to serve me. Go make disciples of all the nations, all the peoples, all the languages. Go and make disciples. Bring my authority, bring my rulership, bring my dominion everywhere around the world. Yes. And at this point, right, until he actually comes to earth again, and establishes his kingdom on earth physically and sits upon that throne. Joining his kingdom is voluntary. Mm -hmm. Right? We get to decide whether or not we will align with the king. Whether we will obey the king. Whether we will pledge our loyalty to the king. Now when he establishes his throne, that's a different matter. You obey the king or else. What is what is Philippians? How does Philippians put it? You know, at the name of Yeshua. Every knee will bow. Both the and ones, every tongue confess. Well, it's those right? in heaven above and on the earth, earth and even under the earth. Yes. Everything, every knee will bow. Because and every tongue all authority has been given will to confess yes. that Yeshua is the Lord, is Messiah. Yep. So that's, that's what it's talking about. When he talks about all authority, he's claiming that passage out of Daniel chapter 7. He is saying, this is, this is what has been given to me. This is what is coming. Now, we don't see everything under his authority right now. No. You know, not everything has been placed under his feet at this time. But will it? Absolutely. And again, the disciples were to be the beginning of that process. Mm -hmm. Of putting everything under his feet, calling the nations, the peoples, to him. Okay. And the kingdom of heaven is near. The kingdom of heaven is within them, right? Because they were supposed to be letting the rulership and the rule of the kingdom start here. Right. We're, we are supposed to, as disciples, as believers in Yeshua, we are supposed to be living under the king's authority as if the king was on the, as if the king is on the throne right now so that's what we are submitting ourselves to our king and so his kingdom is alive right here and we're supposed to see as many people as we can make him king mm -hmm. right here all right so let's keep going therefore go and make People from all nations, that's, I'm reading the complete Jewish version, into Talmudim or disciples. I like how this says it, okay? Immersing them into the reality of the Father, the Son, and the Ruach, HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. right? Baptizing them, immersing them in the name. Why? Why does this say in the re into the reality instead of into the name? Because with... Within the Hebrew language, I know this is written in Greek, but the basis behind what Yeshua is saying is Hebrew. He was either speaking Aramaic or Hebrew, okay? 
The disciples translated it into Greek um, later, right? What he said. But he would have spoken in Aramaic or Hebrew. And so the idea of the name, a name is not just something you, you call, call someone. someone. A name is someone's reputation, someone's essence, who they really are. And so when we are immersed into the name, the essence, the, the reality, the reputation of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. We're being immersed into everything God is. We are learning of Him. Mm -hmm. Right? Think about it like this. You know, Proverbs talks about a good name is more valuable yes. than gold or silver. Or, That's and, Proverbs 22. Yeah, so a good name is one of those things. And, and you know, it is when we are immersing or being baptized into the name, in some ways that's also language of adoption mm. because it's a re-identification that you are being immersed into his name and a good name is more valuable. Right. And so you are taking on his name. You're becoming under, under his family, under his name. And so your identity changes and identifies with his name. All right, so it's not just about you anymore, it's about him. And everything you do and everything you say is a reflection upon that name. And so it's, it's that language of identity, language of adoption. You're, you are immersed, you are baptized into his name. And, that, and his authority then covers over you. You come underneath his protection. You come underneath... His authority you come underneath in his household mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and that's a very important concept within the the ancient world the Jewish world I mean all of those things are essential uh, as far as protections you know well, even even in our culture years ago you know when a, a son would leave his family the father often would say to that son son you bear my name don't disgrace my name Right, he was talking about people knowing that he was his son, and so if the son were to go out and do unreputable things, that would reflect on the father, mm -hmm. right? And so the father wants the son to make sure that everything he does is in good character so that. The name of the good reputation that the father has built up can stay with the son. Mm -hmm. Right? It's not talking about the name Johnson is better than the, than the last name Smith or, you know, pick your name, right? It's not saying that. It's saying that we are immersed into the name, into the reputation of who God is. What is his heart? Moses asked when in Exodus 33 that God would show him his glory. And he also asked that God would teach him his way so he could know him. Mm -hmm. So his ways, his uh, reputation, and Moses was very highly concerned with the reputation of God. Mm-hmm. Right amongst the other peoples, so that idea of reputation is very important in this idea of immersing or being baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. The name of the Father is given to the Son, and that is carried on through us through the power of the Holy Spirit. And, and when we don't, you know, live in that name when we bring bad reputation to that name you know that's breaking a commandment that says don't take the name of the lord in vain mm -hmm. that's that's the kind of thing that it's talking about that our actions in our lives are reflective and reflection upon him right. and so you know how many times do we hear that complaint about people who are saying well i don't go to church because it's so full of, of hypocrites or whatever else like that 
And so we as disciples, if we are claiming the name of the Father and the Son and the Ruach HaKodesh, you know, how do we know how to live in such a way that will uphold his reputation? That's what discipleship is supposed to be. It's you, this is, you're learning to live in such a way that is pleasing to him and maintains his integrity, maintains his reputation, and does not make him look bad. And that's why it's important we live by his ways and that we, the reason why we don't get to choose how we live, you know, ourselves, mm -hmm. you know, and, and when we put aside the Torah and don't see it as applicable to the life of a redeemed person and we're deciding for ourselves what that life is supposed to look like, we will define what righteousness is. Mm hmm. It's not our name we bear. We don't get to decide. We it's don't get to his. set the rules for the house. You know, it's always kind of a, a danger uh, when uh, the kids, you know, you have little kids, toddlers, five or six-year-olds, if they get to set the rules for the house instead of the parents. You know, well, kids get to decide everything that they want to do. You know, kids get to decide what we're having for dinner Kids get to decide when they go to bed. Kids get to decide when they wake up. The kids decide whether or not they're going to go to school or what you're going to watch or all those other kind of things or what they're going to wear. Does life work that way? It's, it shouldn't. <laughs> it will be a mess. Yes. And that kid will not grow up to be a very functioning adult, healthy adult. None less a good reflection of their mother and father. Mm -hmm. And so that was actually one of the, the points that I was going to bring up earlier, and I, I restrained myself. You know, that's one of the consequences of our theology when we say that the Torah is done away with, that the Torah is not for the life of a believer in Yeshua, a believer in Jesus. We don't need the Torah. Jesus, you know, he lived the Torah perfectly, so we don't have to. Well, what How many of you have heard that one out there, right? Mm -hmm. so <laughs> what we're doing when we say that is... We are basically taking the rules of the house and throwing them out and say, we're going to live how we want, but we still want to live in the house. Mm -hmm. uh, and we don't have the right or the authority to do that. All authority has been given to him. Yeah. And, and this is what he says. He says, then once you make them a disciple, once you make them someone who takes on my name, once you make them someone who acknowledges me as king, then they have to be taught. They have to be taught what to do, how to live, how to operate as a citizen of my kingdom. Teaching them, obey. yeah, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And my next is to obey. <laughs> yeah, to observe right? and observe means not just look at. Observe right. means to put into practice. Right. And do. To obey. Yeah. And so, you know, the, uh, the new citizens have to be taught. Mm -hmm. We still have that process at work today when we, when we have, you know, immigrants that come in legally and they want to apply for citizenship. They have to be taught certain things about this country, about the Constitution, about our processes, about our system of government, about all of these different types of things. And then they have to take a test to make sure they understand that. Many of them know. No. <laughs> What it means to be a citizen of the United States even more than we who are born here. Mm -hmm. And so when this is a statement that is made to both Jew and Gentile. Both Jew and Gentile. Because this is going out to the nations. Because it's going out to the nations. But it starts in Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. And so the nations are supposed to be taught. And what is a disciple anyway? Talmudim. What is a Talmudim? Uh, Define Talmudim for me. Oh, goodness. I'm, all of a sudden, I'm blanking. Really? Yes, I am. Because <laughs> my brain was going somewhere else. Uh, help me out here. I'm, I'm stuck. <laughs> I'm stuck. As soon as you say it, I'm going to know. Okay. We are teaching. That requires what? That we've been taught. <laughs> He's not cooperating. <laughs> uh, I tell a team, a, a disciple is a student. It's a student. <laughs> he says that like yeah, that's right. <laughs> okay, 
So yeah, a disciple is a student. So naturally, a student is someone who is taught. Taught and learning. Someone who mm -hmm. is learning. Learning from someone who has been through this process already. You know, it's you have to go through the process in order to uh, teach the next generation of people. You have to be taught right. I mean, uh, it's one of those things. I mean, I've worked in, in a factory before where we're assembling some, some uh, machine type of things. You know, it was actually for tractors and such. And imagine if, it, you know, if it's a 10-step process, but the person you learned it from skipped step number seven mm. and forgot to teach me step number seven. And so every part that I make after that is not going to include step seven. And then it may not get caught for some, maybe it's something that's not obviously that, that you can see. Maybe it's not an outward part. For, right, huh? And so, yeah, it okay. might not be discovered Until for, for weeks. And, and in the meantime, you know, they hire somebody else and they say, hey, Kelly, teach this guy how to make this part. Well, guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to teach them as I was taught, and I'm going to not include step number seven because I was not taught to do step number seven. Does that make sense? So that's, and w when we remove the Torah mm -hmm. from our theology, from our practice, from our life as a disciple, it's like we're skipping and missing some steps. Okay, so here it says, teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. So Yeshua has made some commands. All, all authority has been given, and this is one of them. Mm -hmm. All authority has been given to him in heaven and on earth. By whom? From his father. Mm -hmm. So um, if he's going to uphold the name of his father, is he going to contradict or do away with the law or with how do I, his the father's teaching, commands, the instructions. Actually, that's what Torah means, instructions. Is he going to do away with the instructions of his father? Or is he going to pass those instructions on? Mm -hmm. Right? Came from the father to the son, and the son's going to pass them on. He's taught the disciples, and now he is telling them, now I'm sending you. That's what takes them from being a disciple to an apostle. They were a student. Now they are one who is sent to teach what they have learned. Mm -hmm. So for Yeshua to do away with the Torah is is to essentially defame his father's name. Yes. Because everything he says, you know, he says specifically, you know, um, that I'm not saying anything that my father has not told me to say. I believe you can find that in John chapter chapter 12, actually. Mm -hmm. And so the, Yeshua's commands... And the Father's commands are never going to be in conflict. They are never going to be contradict each other. The Son is never going to usurp authority away and do away with or nullify what the Father has spoken, ever. And so what Yeshua commands... That would make command, him a bad son. That would make him a bad son who is not reflecting well on the, the name. Father. Mm -hmm. And so he, you are, we, as... The words of the Father and what the Father has spoken has come to the Son, and when he passes them on to his disciples, it's going to be the same thing that his Father has said. And then what we are supposed to take, what Yeshua has taught his disciples, and that's what we're supposed to take. And so we are in a direct line by that reasoning. It's a direct line to from the Father through Yeshua to his people out to the nations through the spirit and of course it's the same spirit that was in the disciples that is in god's people even still today mm -hmm. right and, and so, what is the what does the holy spirit help us do as according to ezekiel 36 to obey to observe his laws yeah Yahweh. the laws of god right that is one of his primary he's the he is the the one who guides us into all of truth he's the spirit of truth well, Scripture defines truth as Torah is truth. Mm -hmm. Your word is truth. Yes. This is Ezekiel 36. This is, 
you know, one of those things that's often missing when we describe the work and the role of the Holy Spirit. He says, I will put my Ruach, my spirit within you. Then I will cause you to walk in my laws. So you will keep or you will guard or you will observe my rulings and do them. And do them. And, do them. and so whose laws are, is the spirit supposed to help us to keep? The laws of God. And the laws of the Father. And so if the Spirit is dwelling within us and he's to help us keep the laws, it's not, Yeshua's laws and the Father's laws are not going to be something different. Yeshua took, remember he said in John chapter 5 that Moses wrote about him. Mm -hmm. Right? And so yes, what, what does Yeshua do? He properly teaches the laws of his Father. You know, and sometimes they, they, they go deeper than we realize. Well, most, I mean, sometimes probably everyone will go deeper than we realize, right? Mm -hmm. But, and so that's what he did. You know, even the Jewish people, they taught, when they talk about, even though they don't, um, the majority of them don't believe Yeshua is the Messiah. And so they'll put it in terms of this. When Messiah comes... He will bring a new Torah, not in the, in the sense that it is something completely different. New content. It's but not he, new content. Not, not new content, but he is going to teach Torah in such a way it will seem brand new. It will just be totally, you know, he will wow us. And all of with the, the teaching of All the, the Torah. debates, all the questions, all the confusion or disagreements are going to be dealt with and answered you see that also like in the woman at the well mm. uh when she's talking with yeshua and you know she says well you know we worship here on this mountain but you jews say we have to be down there in in jerusalem and she's kind of like you know who's going to explain all of this and she says at one point you know we know we believe that when messiah comes he will explain everything to us he'll settle all of these questions he'll address all of our false teachings or misteachings, and there won't be room for disagreement anymore because Messiah will be the one who's laying down the law, if you want to use that kind of a phrase. And that, of course, I, I think we talked about this passage earlier when we were going through the covenants, but that is the idea of Isaiah chapter 2, mm -hmm. that in the last days, the mountain of Adonai's house will be established as the most important mountain will be lifted up right it will be regarded more highly than the other hills and all the nations will stream there many peoples will go and say come let's go up to the mountain of adonai to the house of the god of jacob he will teach he he will teach us his ways and we will walk in his paths for out of zion will go forth torah will go forth the law the word of Adonai from Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. okay. So he's going to teach us. And even the woman at the well knew that idea and that concept that the Messiah is the one who teaches us the Torah. And he's the perfect teacher of Torah. And actually, that is exactly what the Sermon on the Mount was. Mm -hmm. He started to teach Torah. And he wowed them. <laughs> yes, he did. And he's still teaching. wowing us. Yes, he is. With his teaching. And of course, he started with the Ten Commandments. Where does the Mosaic Law start? The Mosaic Law starts with the Ten Words, or what we call the Ten Commandments. Mm -hmm. When God came down and spoke, that's where the Mosaic Covenant starts. And so that is where he started. And really, he starts with their redemption, his identity mm. as their redeemer. Yes. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. You know, he's like, I have redeemed you. I'm the one who redeemed you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Nobody else. So, of course, that is where Yeshua starts. So, Yeshua started that process of teaching his people Torah all the way back when he came the first time on the Sermon on the Mount. Mm -hmm. So... We have, we have to be very careful when we have these ideas of, okay, that's not applicable. That's not for us. That's not for us as believers. There are certain things within Torah that are not applicable today. 
primarily because there is no functioning consecrated temple. Mm -hmm. The king's not on the throne. Right? And so these things may have been set aside for a time, but they're coming back. Ezekiel lets us know that. Mm -hmm. that the, the Messianic temple, it's going to be huge and it's going to be functioning. Mm -hmm. It's going to be functioning. So What a day. Yeah. <laughs> that so would be, right? We are, as we go, right. as we are making disciples, the command is going and Make making, disciples. immersing, you know, all, the, all of those words are you know, kind of descriptors of how we go. As we go, we make disciples. As we go, we immerse them or bring them into the family. Right. As we go, we teach them to observe uh, all I have commanded you. And this is another consequence of saying that the Torah is done away with. If we are saying that the Torah is done away with, then we can't fulfill that part. No. Because we're not teaching them we what he's commanded teach us to teach. We cannot teach them to observe what he has commanded us if we don't keep the Torah ourselves. If we don't think that that's for us, then we're not going to if teach If we're it. not a student of the Torah. Yeah. And so we can't, by throwing out the Torah, we really cannot keep this verse the way we're supposed to. And again, the word Torah itself means instructions. Which implies the person who is, that there is a person being instructed or taught, i.e. there is a student. Mm -hmm. Right? And that is the disciple. That is the redeemed person. Mm -hmm. So there is a teacher, the Messiah. The words are from God. Yeshua is the word. He lived it out perfectly. We are the students of God's instruction. Mm -hmm. And it's instructions on how to hit the mark. You know, we talk about sin. Sin is missing the mark. Sin is the breaking of the Torah, according to mm -hmm. 1 John 3, 4. So if sin is the breaking of the Torah, then, then righteousness is the, the keeping and the obedience to the Torah. It's, it's hitting the mark. This is, the Torah is instructions on how to hit the mark. That's not a claim saying that you ever do it perfectly or completely, but even within the Torah, there are means and mechanisms to uh, address that when we don't. You know, I, I've always thought it was kind of funny um, because the same book, First John, that, that says that sin is um, the, breaking, the, of the breaking of the Torah, the breaking of the law, the same book that says that, in the same book that says that, John also says, if you confess your sins, and he's saying that to believers. Mm -hmm. But if sin is the breaking of the law, but the law does not apply to us as believers, then guess what? We as believers do not sin, and therefore we have nothing to confess. So why in the world did John write that? If the, sin does not, if the law of the Torah does not apply to us in any way, then... We're basically telling him we don't break anything. We, we don't we, sin. We, we, have, sin. we have nothing to confess. Why would we need to confess something that doesn't apply to us? Sometimes it's, it's like when we just simply take a step back and apply simple logic, it doesn't even work. Mm -hmm. Right? So again, why would John tell redeemed people to confess their sins? If we don't sin because the Torah doesn't apply to us and sin is the breaking of the Torah. Mm -hmm. So we have to be careful sometimes with our words and we have to think, really truly think through our theology and not just take things for granted because the, we've heard it all our the lives. The implications of what we right. say. Right. So that's that's this Matthew 28 passage is teaching them to observe, to put into practice all that he has commanded. And remember, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. You know, he is there right with us, right beside us to give us the strength, to give us the teaching, to give us the power uh, to to uh, fulfill this command. Um, yeah. And now I want us to go to John, or not John, but Luke, Luke chapter 14. Because even though Yeshua wants his disciples, now his apostles, to go and make 
other disciples, right? Does that mean being a disciple is an easy thing? No. Does that mean it's carefree? Yeshua actually talked about the cost of being a disciple. And for people to count the cost, do you really want to be my disciple? Is this really what you want to do? And to make that decision um, in a way that's not done lightly. Mm -hmm. Right? So let's go to Luke chapter 14, verse 25. Okay. And read all the way through 32, please. It says, Now great crowds were traveling with Yeshua, and he turned and said to them, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father, mother, wife, children, brothers, and sisters, and yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not carry his own cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, wanting to build a tower, doesn't first sit down and figure out the cost to see if he has enough to finish it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and isn't able to finish everything, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going to make war against another king, won't first sit down to consider whether he's able with 10,000 to confront the, uh, the one coming against him with 20,000? If not, while the other is still far away, he sends an ambassador and asks for peace. Mm. Mm. Yeah. I think we've had somebody who hasn't uh, considered the cost of war here recently. <laughs> well, they... I mean, just the idea of him being the king that's coming. Mm -hmm. He's coming. And there is nothing this world's going to be able to do to stop him from coming. There is nothing the enemy is going to be able to do to stop him from establishing his throne. Mm -hmm. Nothing. The king is coming. Okay? Okay. We are called to be his disciples. Correct? Yes, we are. Okay. So notice a lot of times when people read this passage, they they see the first part of the list of hating your, your father, your mother, your wife, your children, right? And they, oh, how terrible. But then it, even yourself. Mm -hmm. In other words... There is nothing, not even our own life, that we should cherish above him. Mm -hmm. So this is more, it's more like a sense of rank or priority, mm -hmm. you know, as far as which is most important. If, if your mother or father or your wife or your kids are more important to you than God, there's a problem. If you'll sacrifice yourself for your kids, but you won't sacrifice yourself for God, that's a, that, again, that's an indication of where you're at spiritually. You, there is, you're not supposed to have no other God before me. That's, this is a statement referring all the way back to that first commandment. And this is, being a disciple is something that costs us something. Yes, it does. You know, we don't, we, it's not something we just do haphazard, like building a tower without, you know, counting the cost of that tower and running out of material and not being able to finish. Mm -hmm. like, like the first example, right? It is something we're supposed to do on purpose. Listen. <laughs> we're supposed to do it on purpose. And it may cost us a great deal. It may cost us our life. Mm-hmm. But that should be a price we willingly pay. Willingly carry that cross. For what he has done for us. And, and it's not the end. Because he is coming. The king is coming. All authority has been given to him. Mm-hmm. And he is our king, and we have aligned ourselves with him. We are his student. We are his disciple. His subject. His, his subject. His citizen. 
his slave, mm -hmm. right? We are his. Where he says go, we should go. What he says do, we should do. And, and especially in this modern world, I know I, I'm talking to myself when I say this, you know, we're very much into our own comfort. Mm -hmm. You can't tell me what to do. Um, I'll decide for myself, or I don't feel like doing that, you know. We have to be very careful because we are called to be disciples. We have been called to do what he tells us to do regardless of anything else. Mm -hmm. So being a disciple is not something that is a light matter. No big deal. Yeah, I follow Jesus. You know. We show up we show up about. once a week and uh, you know, or once a month or once a year and uh, we've kinda checked our little box and that's all we need to do is just kinda do the bare minimum. The minimum doesn't cut it. You know, a disciple is one that is is firmly and completely and totally his. Because at any time you know, he can he can change the course of your life. The king has the authority to tell you where you live. The king has the authority to tell you what you do. The king has the authority to tell you even what you're going to eat. Because you're, you're eating... What every, job you're going to have. What, you're eating from the king's Everything. table, you know, so to speak. Everything you have is from the king's provision. Yeah. Um... And so your life needs to, to honor and reflect that and show him that you are his disciple by doing all of those things. And then as we live our life as his disciple, because we have been taught to observe everything that he has commanded us to do, then everywhere we go, that's the process that we pass on to others to show them this is the way to live, how to please God. And I know that because this is what he, he taught me. And I know that because this is what his instructions say. That's why we need the Torah. That's why we need God's discipleship program of the Torah. We don't need another, you know, Bible study published, you know, book somewhere, <laughs> a new discipleship campaign that shows up every few years and kind of fades away because it's not really all that effective. We need something more than just say, you know, pray, read your Bible, go to church. Go to church. You're good. That's, that's not... Being a disciple. Yeah. We're missing out on his instructions on what a disciple looks like and how a disciple lives, how a disciple worships. Uh, what a part, part of that celebrates. cause maybe you look different, you, your lifestyle is different from everybody else around you, maybe even different from other people in your family. Mm -hmm. That may be part of that cost, but it's worth it. It's worth it because he's our king. Amen. Amen. I guess that's all we have for tonight. It is. And uh, we thank y'all well, for wasn't tuning too in. Much. That's too... <laughs> But, uh, you know, kind we are, do want to invite y'all to, you know, be sure and, and like and share these videos. If you get a chance, please do that. Pass them around. And if you can, we'd love to see, uh, have you join us. So, you know, some Shabbat. Uh, we meet at First Baptist Church in downtown Morristown at 1 p.m. We'd love to have you come and be a part of that. This week, we're actually having an, an owner, an right? Yes. Yes. So uh, a bit after that, we're going to be uh, sticking around and sharing with each other and and eating, and all those other types of things. So we'd love you to come and be a part of that. If you do have any questions or things you'd like to see us talk about or address, you know, leave them in the comments or send an email. You know, you've got the websites there at the bottom of the screen. Uh, my email is pastorkelly at restorationmessiah.com. Uh, so um, we would just love to hear from everybody. Uh, is there anything else that you can think of? Uh, next week, um, we uh, may not be on live on Wednesday nights. Either we'll do it live on Tuesday nights or we'll record it and put it up on Wednesday nights. So just keep that in mind, but be looking for it either way. We'll let you know as we get closer to the time. So. Absolutely. 
Well, for, for now then, y'all have a good night. Enjoy the rest of your evening, okay? Shalom. Shalom. I can get this turned off anytime soon. There we go.